This is a Sunday program, February the 13th, 2005. It just occurred to me, looking on the floor, the patterns of sunlight and then the patterns of these dark knot holes where branches used to come out of a tree. And right now writing an article partly on the movie A Beautiful Mind that John Nash would have loved finding patterns here of sunlight and dark spots. Is chasing after patterns. Try to express them mathematically. What we'll talk about this morning, at least start out this way, is was inspired by starting a new book by Elaine. Hegel. It's called Beyond Belief, but I just started it, so I can't really uh, present you with what Elaine Pagel thinks is beyond belief. I'm really very interested to find that out. She starts out and wondering what draws people to religion, including herself, when she uh, went to religious uh, gatherings and seminars and different churches. The, what was she looking for? What was she seeking? Why do we create religions and find such interest, attachment to religion? And uh, briefly, just thinking back on my own childhood, going on vacation, um, meant visiting cities and always visiting the cathedrals or churches in these cities and the, the, the magnificent impressions of cathedrals with their stained glass light, the high soaring uh, hall, the arches, the icons, and sculptures, having um, myself gone to a Protestant church in Leipzig, there was not any of this adornment um, that we were uh, visiting in different shi- cities, cities. <coughs> and the, the, the fragrance of incense, the, the, the whole thing had a tremendous uh, fascination and and enchantment for a small child. So that was the visual and the sensual, the smell and sounds. (coughs) Sometimes there were choirs, uh, boys' choirs, with their incredible pure tones, sounds. No, vibra- no vibra- vibrato, no overtones, just the, the purity of harmony. Now, do we create and seek out and attach ourselves, ourselves to religion for the, because of a need for protection? I wonder whether this isn't the prime moving force, need for protection, our fears, our fears of our, of the environment in my own childhood, the the impending war and then the actual war, the horrors of war and loss, loss of lives and of course the whole 
fear of the Holocaust, which um, to me was not a flight into religion, but away from it, because there was this monumental disappointment in where was this protecting, loving God who allowed such things to happen. But it didn't work like this for everyone because we have answers for everything, namely that this is to test our faith and there is a wisdom in, in, in God's decisions that we don't understand and fathom if we just trust the, the wisdom then we will not find fault and be turned away by horrible happenings like war. So each one of us can, can ask ourselves why, why do we seek out religion or leave religion or seek something in place of religion? And is it usually the search for security? which is, always eludes us. <coughs> it doesn't elude everybody. Some people have this tremendous, uh, deep-seated security in, their, in the idea that God is protecting them and maybe even experiences of the kind. Right now, with the war in, in Iraq, we're told that human beings, every human being, searches and needs and wants freedom and has the capacity for experiencing freedom, creating it, holding it. And I'm just wondering what it is that we think freedom is, because our mind is so malleable, so gullible, that we can, uh, well, like this book, Orson Welles, or what was, what was his name, not Orson Welles, 1985, George Orwell, yes, 1989, that believing that war is peace, the, some of our uh, missiles are called peacekeepers and, and, and words of that sort trying to um, convince us of something that seems so absurd, so paradoxical. So, um, there's, uh, for me as a child, a tremendous hope for freedom if this regime of Hitler would fall, would be conquered by the invading allied forces. A tremendous hope that this would succeed and that uh, we would be free. And in this case, the freedom meant uh, very concrete things being allowed to participate in whatever we wanted to participate because Jews or half-Jews were excluded from a lot of uh, social activities. And freedom meant no more exclusion, belonging, belonging to whatever the heart desired. But I find it amazing how um, this belief that we're fighting for freedom has really taken hold of a lot of soldiers' minds that, and their families, not all, but that they feel it is worth their sacrifice, worth dying for bringing freedom, freedom to, to vote or freedom of uh, yeah, elections and to, to other people. What about the freedom to, to really think clearly without indoctrination, or the freedom to see indoctrination as that, to, to understand manipulation of the mind. Do we 
teach or bring that freedom to ourselves, to people. Really freedom to think unobstructedly. And unless there is an understanding in all uh, what we call a chain of command, what this means, uh, there cannot be any freedom. There's only the, the desire for power over other people which directs our actions. So, do we have a real deep-seated longing, desire to think clearly, to be able to, to see things as they are and to see when it is that we're being indoctrinated, made to think what somebody wants us to believe, wants us to think. And how can that come about? How, how can we see clearly? How can we think straight? Not crookedly. Is that, is that possible in the midst of all the, the, the propaganda and advertising that is going on and that is getting ever more refined in our society. There are tremendous uh, researches going on, psychological researches on how to dupe the mind so that it will buy things, not just goods and services, but also ideology. This is a a frightening thing going on. study and research into how to dupe the mind. I, I see these things on, on news channels, which are a little bit more liberal than others. You, you always have to take everything with a grain of salt, uh, salt grain of doubt, um, and wonder, is this the truth? And can I tell what is the truth? To to have doubt in the mind, not in the paranoid sense, but wondering so that the mind gains or retains openness, for which it's very important to have dialogue with others, to share experiences, and to, to... investigate one's own motives. Is there the desire to have power over other people's thinking? Do I want others to think the way I do or, or, or do we want to explore something together? Not to, to have this pleasure of being right, but to, to wonder together what is the truth What is the truth of my listening? Is this listening free from wanting to be right? And if we discover this motive, uh, it takes very honest inquiry, the motive to be right, then can that be suspended so that we can look at things openly, also what other people say, and examine them? Examine it by by what standards? Well, we can we can discuss, we can investigate. I I feel this is possible, particularly if we're free to hear somebody say, "You are promoting something. You try to win us over." And then I say, okay, let me look. And give me time to look. Maybe right now I don't see it, but I will keep it in mind and watch. And there will be an occasion where I feel sort of heating up over an opinion, a point of view that I don't want to shed, that I don't want to let go. And that's a sign of uh, not this open freedom to examine. 
So coming back to why do we create religion and, and are drawn to religious rituals, beliefs, occupations? What, what is their nature? Is their nature to examine, to find out, or to believe and to propagate, to propagate belief? I remember in, even in, in Zen study, there are koans, and, and you're aware that a koan is a teaching device, uh, not just the, the well-known ones, but there, there are hundreds of them, which partly serve to also form, form the mind of the, the Zen student. And, and uh, sometimes there are little poems, or, or, or well, they may not be poetic poems, but little capping phrases that say, if you want to support the gate and the house, then such and such, meaning supporting the gate is the temple, and the house is the, the temple too. In other words, there are some koans designed to propagate Zen teaching. And uh, my teacher used to say when I used a word that was not of the common Zen vocabulary. He said, don't, for instance, don't use the word illusion, use the word delusion. Uh, this is just one that comes to mind because you should use the Zen vocabulary. Stick with that. There's a, a good reason for that. So I was not allowed to, to use fresh words, which I welcome very much when people hear use fresh words, provided that these words really express what is being seen in clear seeing, looking, free from uh, an agenda. So, now, um, this was a, r a relatively harmless thing, whether you say illusion or delusion. <coughs> but People will say, particularly when they're new to this place, you have a vocabulary here that is very new to me, and there seems to be maybe an in-group feeling bunching around this vocabulary. And um, are you watching that? Are we? Are we? that there is vocabulary growing up around a work like what we call the work of this moment is unavoidable because communication together is using words and using similar words. If each one of us had their own vocabulary, it would be very difficult to make each other understood, although not impossible, as long as we can Always go back to seeing. Uh, say what we see and then say, this is the word I use for it. I want to see whether I find an example, but maybe in the course of our later discussion, it will happen. In other words, I am not attached to the words we use here, even the word seeing. If you, well, we've sort of started this word, awareing because it, it, it's nice. Um, it is using awareness as an action. If you say, I don't know what this word's, word means, well, we can use seeing or looking, giving attention. So to be free uh, with the words, but they have to describe what it is that is being aware or comes into awareness without a special agenda, which is not propaganda. 
So just the fact that uh, you have to learn what words are being used is not in itself a bad sign. If there comes defensiveness or expecting that people who come here uh, use this vocabulary and are being corrected, well, then that's an, a different matter. We welcome new words. If, as has been said here, they try to describe freshly what comes into present awareness. So, does coming here and engaging in the work of this moment, which is waking up this instant to what is going on inside us, around us, between us, if that, is, if that brings a joy or a, a, an energy, a fresh energy, that, that's a wonderful thing and we can share that energy of experiencing, awareing, and describing this moment-to-moment -moment aliveness that we all share in. Is there any obligation involved with it, any kind of uh, taking precepts or what, what was it called? Um, we had to, at, at, the, at the Zen Center, we had to sort of have, have some allegiance to the, to the teacher. Not, not swear it, but it came very close to a vow. That is not the case here. There's no, no allegiance to any person who does this work. We share it together. If you understand it, do it. Go out and, and share with others what you see and how you put it into, into words that are understandable, not hazy. You can hide behind hazy words, hide your understanding. But um, I was going to say, oh, does this sharing of work of this moment, of experiencing this moment, putting it into words, sharing. Does that bring a feeling of in-group that now has to be defended, codified, if you will? Or is it, is it a flexible, fluid thing? Not that you now belong to something and other people who don't belong, they're the outsiders. Yeah, we have to be very honest with ourselves and, and also listen when people say that this is the case. Examine it. It may be so, it may not be so. But if it is so, then to say, yes, it's, that's not a good thing to feel uh, as an insider who does this work versus others who don't. That is, uh, brings false divisions into our community, which is without division and without borders. There's no, no seam, no end, no size to this community of human beings living in this world, creating this world. So, you could say, well, look, Honestly, it brings me a sense of security if I belong to a place like Springwater Center, if I'm a member, pay my dues. Uh, it brings me some feeling of security, safety, and that's why I join. Well, this is up to you, up to each one. We don't teach that if you believe in anything here, become a member, there will be security bestowed upon you. No, a security is a matter of seeing the truth. Seeing what is, is, is the only security there is. Not believing it, 
You don't have to believe that the sun is shining. You see it. You feel it. You see the marvelous colors light up when the sun comes out from behind the clouds. There's no belief involved in that. So, if, if there is a feeling of love, gratitude, happiness to have people with whom one can engage in this work, this is fine. But as everybody who has engaged in this work for some time has found out, it does not automatically bestow security. On the contrary, diving into what I am and what I'm not can bring a tremendous amount of anxiety because our cherished self-images are being questioned and maybe <clears throat> dented or shattered, seen for what they are, idea, because there is no such thing as a living image that I am. I am not an image. I am the sun and the air and the sounds and the heart beating and the trees without leaves, snow falling, snow melting, constantly changing in a space of awareness, not fixable in imagery. And when we find that out, that we are not the image that we have held on to, there can come great feelings of insecurity, anxiety, fear. And then let's look into it. Let's share that. Let's question where does fear come from? How does it arise and can it come to an end? Not forever, but right now at this moment of seeing the truth of a thought arising, arousing fear. And the absence of that thought is the absence of fear. That has to be experienced by each one of us. And it comes with inquiry into it. What is fear? How does it arise? And can it end? Not forever, but now, right this, this instant of listening and awareing without an agenda, just a slight hum of a fan or motor, the breathing, maybe some hum in the ears, some tingling in the hands, the physical, palpable aliveness of this body-mind. We have about an hour? Do we have an hour?